Hi, I'm Todd Houlihan. Welcome to the seventh edition of our Portable XRF series on best practice application of the technology. Today I'm joined by Ted Shields, the Vanta product manager. Hi Ted. Hey Todd, how are you doing? Really good, and you? Great. All right, today we're going to talk about sample preparation. So how do PXRF users figure out how much sample preparation they need to do? The level of sample preparation depends on the objectives of each individual user. So it could be no sample preparation, it could be full sample preparation, and everything in between. Ultimately, a customer needs to test, challenge, and then decide on what level of sample pre preparation will meet their objectives. And we're also going to show them some of this equipment that we have behind us, right? Indeed, we're going to start out with really basic levels of equipment, right through to quite advanced levels of sample prep. So with PXRF, we're taking an established laboratory technique and bringing it out into the field. Exactly, and when taking that out into the field, we encounter all sorts of different samples. So ultimately, the quality of the data will be dictated by the quality of the sample. So let's look at the journey of our samples. First, you need to collect the samples. And with PXRF, you can collect a whole lot of samples and a lot of data points, and that gives you very fine-grained information about your project. Typically then, a few of those are sent off to the laboratory and they get more detailed information on a particular sample. The way they do that is to dry the sample, then crush it, and then grind it. And they do this to make the sample homogenous before they dissolve it in acid or make a fused bead or a pressed pellet. So if your data quality objectives include uh, comparing to laboratory data, you may want to consider doing the same sorts of things that a laboratory does. So let's start with stage one at the lab, drying. How does moisture affect portable XRF results? There are two main effects. The first of which is that the moisture in the sample absorbs some of the X-rays that normally get back to our detector. So that makes us under-report on some elements. Uh, the other is that in the factory we calibrate on dry samples and the dry samples weigh a little bit less than the moist samples. So this also tends to make us under-report on moist samples. Yeah, well in my experience we always under-report on moist samples, always. Yeah, that's right. And so we get then asked two questions. One, how much moisture can you tolerate? And the second is then uh, if the moisture level is consistent, can we just go ahead and correct for it? Okay, how much can we tolerate? On the transition metals, heavier metals, about 5 to 10% moisture seems to have very little impact on portable XRF results. And question two is a little bit more complicated to answer. Different elements are impacted uh, in different ways by different levels of moisture. So again, send the samples to the lab, get some moisture measurements either before you send them using a moisture meter or at the lab, get the data back, have a look at the correlation with your portable XRF results and see if the data can be fit for purpose. Only the customer can decide whether it's okay or not. So do you have some customer examples then? Yeah, lots. One example is customer testing quite moist clay soils, put all their samples in clip lock plastic bags and then presses down on each one to sort of squeeze out as much moisture as they can. Another example, one customer putting all their samples on coffee filters and trying to suck out as much moisture within a designated couple of hour period. Another customer puts all their samples out for air drying for 24 hours before testing them. So as long as you treat your sample consistently, you're likely to get consistent results. Probably really good for trending, but to get the absolute concentration value is probably you need to evaluate. Exactly, yep. One really interesting application was testing the core cutter slurry. So collecting the slurry from cutting, say, a metre of core, uh, drying it, of course, before analysis, but you've got a really fine powder representative of a, of a metre of core. Quite labour intensive, but ingenious. Yeah, so there are no rules. You can test whatever's at hand, but then you need to evaluate it and make sure that it really is fit for purpose. Exactly. Bit of a common theme running through this uh, series, Ted. Indeed. There's also some good reading on the Association of Applied Geochemists website, work that Camiro undertook in 2012, 2013, on all sorts of things, but moisture is included in there. Uh, really good stuff. Keep, read it in context because the technology was six or seven years older, but worth a read, definitely. Okay, moving on from moisture. Uh, homogeneity. Mm -hmm. So there's probably three categories we can set up of 
different sample types. Samples requiring no preparation, samples requiring partial preparation, and samples requiring full preparation, say down to 150, 250 micron. Yeah, so PXRF is used for so many different types of samples and uh, for so many different uses, it's really hard to give general advice. But in general, what's going on is that you're trading off your precision for how much time you want to invest in sample prep. Right, and so because it's so difficult to give generic advice, let's use some real world examples for those three categories. Let's start with no sample preparation. So we have hundreds of customers testing directly on drill core, directly on rock faces, directly on soils, uh, directly on unprepared blast hole samples. And all of those samples are heterogeneous. So a lot of our customers are taking multiple measurements and taking the average of those readings to overcome that. They're getting qualitative, semi-quantitative data, but it's fit for purpose. We've also got customers taking, testing gold inactivated carbon directly on the carbon. They're also doing uh, copper in liquids at SXEW plants, no sample preparation. So there's a wide range of applications for uh, customers doing no sample prep. For the partial sample prep, those are typically done for soil surveys, which are doing really well for things like you know, base metals uh, for gold and uh, pathfinder elements for gold. That's where we typically find the partial sample prep being used. Really common in that space, yeah. And as the portable XRF becomes used so much more widely, customers are starting to test more samples that have been fully prepared to get the best quality data they can from their XRF. So it's becoming really common in sample prep facilities before the samples go to the laboratory or samples being returned from the laboratory. Uh, really good to get the best performance, the best light element data, for lithogeochemistry studies where the boundaries between rock types are really strictly defined, uh, full sample prep is becoming more and more common. And when you've invested that kind of time in the sample, typically you'll test them in a sample cup or in a pressed pellet where you're going to get your best performance for light elements. Again, because if you're shooting in a plastic bag, unless you're just doing the heavier elements, um, your performance is going to get degraded by the attenuation from the plastic bag. Exactly. Shall we have a look at some of this uh, stuff? Yeah, let's. Olympus is not a sample preparation equipment provider. We specialise in what we do best, which is manufacture portable XRF. Sample preparations, there's no one size fits all solution. So do your research, have a look at what's on the market and decide what equipment you need to achieve your data quality objectives. On the very simple side, we have things like a hammer, a mortar and pestle, run you through a sieve to get a powder, put that powder in a sample cup with a proline film. More sophisticated, we have this mill, which runs on AC power. You put your sample in the bottom, it takes up to a 10 millimeter size sample. Um, screw it on, and press, and grind. Um, this has been found to be very popular with some of our clients, because it can also handle very hard rock. Yeah. This equipment here is provided by OnSite, specifically designed for the portable XRF industry. It's based around an off-the-shelf angle grinder, with some specialist attachments to the front end. This attachment is a beta mill, sample goes in there. When it's turned on, the beta mill crushes the rocks after you place the lid on and screw it down. An alternative attachment is this rotary rock grinder, a cutting saw, which when placed on there, can enable you to cut through rock faces, rock outcrop, and collect the resultant chips and powder in a test tube style attachment. That material can then be passed through some sieves and then this torque wrench press used to develop nice powdered pellets from which you can test directly on the surface, avoiding any proline film you might use with a sample cup. Another vendor are Reflex. They, they're part of the Index group. They make this rock crusher that will take 25 millimeter feed, crush it down to one to two millimeters, and it will take a kilogram of RC material and process it in about a minute and a half. This is the reflex mill. Feed size of four millimeters down to a fine powder in a single pass. Both of these systems run on universal AC power. 
There's also the reflex press, which makes these nice pucks that are very dense, uh, very consistent, and have a nice flat surface. So they're, they're quite good for XRF analysis. I used the reflex press uh, on a project in Ireland last summer, and the data we got on the XRF off the pucks was exceptional. And throughput? I know one customer doing about 150 samples per shift on a two-person operation. Outstanding. So you can see that there are a wide range of materials and, and equipment that you can use to do your sample preparation. So do your homework and see what works best for you. So to conclude, some of you may be required to do some sample prep to achieve your data quality objectives. As with all previous advice, do some test work to determine what level of sample preparation you need for your XRF program to be fit for purpose. Right, and so next time we'll be looking at QA, QC protocols to determine fit for purpose. Exactly. We're starting to generate analytical data, so we need to take responsibility for the integrity of that data. So we'll provide some advice on how to do that. Until then, bye for now. Bye for now.